you who joined the first live stream. Um, we had some technical problems that were my fault, uh, a setting that I had turned off inadvertently and uh, did not allow us to hear and see my guest today. So um, if you're joining the live stream, um, please definitely drop your comments and questions into the uh, comments or, or into the comment section and we're happy to bring those into the conversation. Um, as you're joining, um, please give a shout out to your, or I'm sorry, share with your, uh, with your um, networks this conversation. I think it will be now that we are able to have the conversation and you're able to hear and see both, both sides of the conversation. It'll be much more interesting. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the setting that I had turned off um, messed up the connection with Pam's audio and video. So the most important part of the conversation was, uh, was muted. And so now that we can hear and see Pam, this will be a much more uh, interesting and productive conversation. Uh, tonight, again, by way of introduction, for those of you jumping back in, we're talking about student-centered classrooms and the importance of equity and representation in a student-centered classroom. Um, and I'm going to, Pam, I'm going to ask you to kind of give that brief overview again okay. of the importance of representation in a student-centered classroom, specifically for uh, minority students, um, whatever the minority is, why that's so important to learning. Right. So um, students of color and, and of other marginalized communities, they're often oppressed outside of the school. They may live in rough neighborhoods. They may come from um, difficult situations at home. And so school should be the place, because they're there for eight or nine hours a day, school should be the place where they feel safe and where they feel centered. And by centering student of color and LGBTQ teen, um, you really need to have texts that represent them. So students need to read books that have uh, people of color and LGBTQ in as protagonists, as the main characters. We don't need any more coming out stories. We don't need any more slave anthologies. We don't need any more of the, um, the typical Asian smart nerdy kid. We don't need that anymore. Kids need to see themselves reflected back into stories that are relevant to what they're doing. Black kids roller skate, the Latinx community uh, skateboards, whatever it is, they need to see themselves in that. And when teachers are culturally competent, they are able to recognize that their students need this, and they're also able to teach it from a place of cultural competency. So let's let's also define the terms for um, people who may not know, and, and for myself most specifically, because this is a topic that is important to me as, a, as an educator. When you say cultural competence and a teacher who has cultural competence, I know what those two words mean separately, but when you put them together and the way you're using it, what it, what do you mean by that, or and what is the outcome of that? There may be a textbook definition, sure. but the definition that works when you're culturally competent, you're sensitive to the needs, desires, wants, whatever of the community of your classroom. So say, for example, say you have a, a majority of African-American students in your classroom, you would address them differently than you would address the white kids. You don't, you have to delve a little bit into their history to understand. You can't just say, oh, you know, can you bring in some watermelon for whatever day? That, that, that's insensitive. Um, say, for example, you have a large Latinx community. You must know that um, the Mexican people are different from Puerto Rican people. They're different from uh, people from Spain, right? Or even from Panama. 
And it doesn't take that much work just to understand the difference. For example, like the Puerto Rican people, they eat mofongo, right? Mexican people don't eat that, right? Or you might think Mexican people eat tacos. No, that's Tex-Mex, right? It's not that difficult to do. Just like when you get your roster for the air and you look at your classmates and you learn how to pronounce their names and you know what child you had his older sister two years ago, what the situation is at home. It's the same with understanding the culture. Understand that you can't speak to each child the same way. You have to recognize that they are from a different culture and ethnicity than your own. So a major component, it sounds like, initially, at least a first step, is awareness. It's sensitivity. It's almost, it's almost like an exercise of empathy. It's a, it's a, it's a um, being aware. And, and we do this as teachers, to your point already, where we look at, okay, who do I have in my class? What, and, and that's what we spend a lot of times, especially at the beginning of, say, a term or a semester, of getting to know our students. You know, this, does this student do better? You know, are they a better visual learner? Or, and we're looking for right. those cues all the time. And so this being culturally sensitive is, is just another tool that we can add to our toolbox to be effective as educators. Mm -hmm. Then, right. go ahead, sorry. Just like you want to key into the family dynamics, is there a mother in the house? Does she work outside the home? You can't just assume that just because the child is African-American that there's from a single parent home. Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing you would do with any other child. Just, just offer them dignity mm -hmm. and respect. Yeah. Right? And so we, we talked briefly, and, and we'll dive deeper into all of these topics, uh, specifically about um, equity, and, and we talked about representation in, in say, the, the books that are brought in or, or presented to the students, the, the activities, the, the examples. A teacher can be mindful of all of those things. Um, in defining these terms as we lay out this discussion, can you also give me kind of your, again, not a textbook definition, but kind of your definition or how you would define or how you see equity? When we say the word equity for you, what does that mean in relationship to um, the work of the teacher and the student? When you're teaching a when you're trying to be an equitable teacher, you have to understand, you can't just have Black History Month or Mexican American History Month. It would be equitable for every child in the classroom if you just say, here's a book, it happens to be by a Latinx author. Here's a book, it just happens to be from Africa, or, you know, here's a book, here, here's Kelly Yang's latest book, whatever. So you treat everybody with dignity and respect, right? Everybody gets a chance to be heard and seen. They're not singled out so that when you finally read a book, when you finally read Alice Walker, and, you know, the only black girl in the class is like, oh, here they go. They're going to ask me to speak for everybody. That's what equity is, making sure everybody gets the same treatment and doesn't feel, well, what's what I want, like pointed out un unnecessarily. Yeah, I think, and, and it's, it's something, like I said, we do as teachers, we're always looking for how can we make the material not only relevant, but also um, help students to connect to the material because learning is the most important outcome. And, and centering our classroom on the student and the student's experience, whether they're a visual learner, or an audio learner, whatever, however they learn, but also the content and the way it's presented, all of these things, again, I kind of see it as, as tools that we have in our arsenal to be more effective, to help students have a broader um, and more well-rounded education. Um, it does nobody, no student, uh, good to only present certain 
facts of history or certain perspectives of history or literature or you know the English language or whatever the subject matter is that we're that we're presenting I see these these considerations and and being mindful of how because honestly as teachers we're not taught you know we're taught from a kind of kind of kind of anglocentric way of right. a pedagogy and so for mm -hmm. a lot of us this is a step outside of our comfort zone it's a step outside of our competency in some regard um, not that we're right. not competent as teachers so the question that came up for me that I hope will be helpful to other teachers is um, when I come into the classroom where do I start because this can seem so overwhelming uh, like uh, and I don't, for me as a teacher, this is just me being transparent. I don't want to turn my classroom into a giant token, um, a giant exercise in tokenism where, right. oh, I better make sure I have, you know, th three examples from this sect, sect or set right. or this, you know. So how, where do we start? How can we start in simple ways to really demonstrate mindfulness in a way that will foster student um that a student can feel comfortable in our classroom and can begin to learn and begin to build trust with students. So we all know that kids can smell garbage a mile, a mile away, right? They know whether you're into them or not, right? And so uh, there's a book that I think I suggested to you by Cornelius Minor. It's called We Got This. And he's very good about learning how to relate to each child where they are. And so kids have come with some very heavy issues to him because they trust him, because they know that he cares. And why does he care? He asks them questions about their lives. So for example, say you come from a white suburban neighborhood, the issues in your neighborhood are going to be very different than the issues maybe from the students that you come from. It might behoove you to sit in their shoes and you know find out where they live. What's going on in your neighborhood? Or what books are you reading? What would you like to read? What issues are going on? So say for example, um, there was a heroin bust in that neighborhood. Go to your librarian, ask her, do you have any books about drug use? The librarian is going to be thrilled and she's going to give you 72 million books that you can give to your kids and go, hey, if you're interested in working through this, here's a book. I don't, I, I don't know anything about this topic. However, I care about you. Let's learn this together. See, and yeah. the same way you do that with math and history, it's especially relevant. Yeah, that's a... I appreciate that piece of advice. I want to kind of lift that out and elevate and highlight that because that's something I've learned that's probably the most powerful thing that I've learned as, as far as an educator, being an educator, because I moved into education in a non-traditional path. Um, and one of the most powerful tools is that that you just pointed out, being able to say, I don't know, let's figure it out. And to be able to say to a student authentically, hey, I don't know a lot about this, um, but here's something that might be helpful. Or, right. And also, I imagine, I've not been in yet the situation, but I imagine um, we're kind of using literature because that's your expertise, and I think that's a great context. Mm -hmm. If I were a literature teacher, to be able to say, in a, let's look at this piece of literature and let's talk about what's happening in our community mm -hmm. in light of this literature or let's, you know, and instead of inviting students into the conversation, instead of saying, hey, why did those people do this? Or right. why did that happen? You invite all the students into the conversation to, to, to be able to process and also... Right engage the learning process. And not only not only invite them in, but you have to, for lack of a better phrase, become them. Mm. Part of being culturally competent is stepping out of your whiteness, stepping out of your privilege and mm -hmm. becoming 
the 15 year old Latinx kid who might not trust you because he had another white teacher that he couldn't trust. Right. So part of being culturally competent is getting in the mind of that community. Uh Right. So if I were 15 and I were a Brown kid and there were gang fights in my neighborhood all the time and Three years ago, I got the snot beat out of me because I brought textbooks home. I'm not bringing textbooks home, right? So what would I do? I would probably put on a front so that it looks like I'm tough and that I don't care. When really, I just want something to do with my brain. Yeah. So how can I meet that kid? Give him a Kindle. Tell him, show him how to read books online on his phone, right? Offer to keep a book here in school for him. Right, but you yeah. have to get in that kid's shoes and see the world from where they are, not from your way up here, white in your lily yeah. white neighborhood. You drive your Prius, yeah, and you go yeah. back out, right? And I think that's that's so mm-hmm. valuable um, for any student to because often, especially, and I teach high school students, um, especially in high school, a student isn't necessarily of any background is not necessarily going to come into my classroom and and just spill their guts and say, you know, this right. week's a really bad week. My girlfriend or boyfriend broke up with me, or mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm getting bullied or whatever is going right. on, and so. That's, I think, really important to kind of step into somebody's shoes. And, I, you know, it's kind of the age-old wisdom, treat others how we'd want to be treated. It's really, again, going back to empathy, imagining, using our imagination to say, what could be going on for this person? What, what am I seeing? As a teacher, we're kind of right. hyper-trained to observe and to see the signals of what's happening in our classroom and we can turn those skills around to really help us connect with students to build the trust that may to to your example if a trust if trust had been broken from a teacher who last year a teacher who looked like me and so now i'm getting all that projected onto me the only way i'm going right. to be able to build trust is to slowly step in with empathy kindness compassion care and to create a safe space to build the trust, and I think I, I'm thinking as as a as a person of you know with a, a presenting white person with privilege and access and opportunity. Sometimes, and as a teacher, sometimes I just want okay, we we have a lesson plan, and we need to get you know I have, I have certain things I have an agenda I have certain things I need to get through, and I'm realizing even as we're having this conversation that building trust is in all human interaction is a process and it takes time and it takes con- commitment and repetition. And I imagine it's even stronger and, and those it, the essential components are more important in this, the context of what we're talking about. Right. So imagine you have a classroom full of every, you know, kind of child that there is. And um, all of a sudden, Oprah Winfrey, the, the, you know, she, she comes up in the news, right? Everybody looked at the black kids, right? And the black kids are like, why are you looking at me, right? That's a very easy thing to do. You just address your class ahead of time. Say, look, I'm not putting up, you know, anytime we talk about something, I'm not having it. Don't look at them. They're not the representation for everybody. If they want to speak on it, they can. But that's where the teacher has to take control and say, look, this is how we will respect everybody in the classroom. We will read books from other, you know, uh, races or ethnicities and religions. We will respect everybody. We're not going to tokenize anybody. We're not going to fetishize anybody here. And once, once the marginalized kids see that you really do mean that Mm -hmm. there's a good chance that they might want to open up to you and And, and if you what was it they say walk that walk yeah yeah and i have found this it's interesting because we're talking about this in the context of particularly race or or um 
you know, ethnic background. Obviously, um, there's a plethora of other minorities, socioeconomic minorities, LGBTQ minorities, right. everything um, that are in our classroom. But I have seen this even in my own classroom. I'm, I'm really surprised how quickly students will fall into line when there's a clear expectation of mutual respect and not just the hey that's not appropriate but when I stop the class and whatever my agenda is long enough to say this is how we show respect or this is how I expect for us to behave in this classroom starting with right. me um, I, I've seen where then students end up be moving often into leadership kind of informal leader positions in the classroom and in the conversations and they end up leading the learning in a sense and that's one of the most um the neatest places to be i think as a teacher is a place where the t the students are in a sense taking leadership of their own learning and uh i had never thought of this framework of of um equity and representation as a tool that can that can foster leadership of learning in the classroom. Everybody wants to feel respected. Sure. The kids are out there and they're gangs. There's a hierarchy, right? It's mm -hmm. all about respect. So why is it the minute that child comes into the school, they get no respect from anybody? And you wonder why the child isn't responding to you or why they've checked out. Because mm -hmm. you're not showing them any respect that they deserve as a human being. Right. So the another question that came up this week as I was thinking of, of some of these things, and um, and if you're joining the, the live stream again, we had some technical difficulties at the beginning, but I'm so glad you jumped back in. Um, please feel free to drop your comments, your questions, your observations in the comments. And I'm happy to bring those questions in, especially if you're if you're in education, if you're a teacher, and you have questions about this very important uh, topic of representation and equity in your classroom, and and how to navigate that. This is a great opportunity to ask those questions. Please feel free to drop those in the comments as you come into into the live stream, and I'm happy to uh, pose those questions here. One of the questions I had is. It's kind of a, a, a silly thing, but I think all of us face some imposter syndrome in our lives. We feel like maybe I don't belong at the front of the classroom. I know I dealt with that a lot at the beginning of my teaching career. Like, am I good enough? I, I told my boss when I started, just make sure I don't hurt the kids. You know, make sure I don't I don't teach them something that's going to mar them for life. Or you know, because in my head I had like. I, I felt like I didn't know the right protocols or the right frameworks or the things I would have learned in, you know, in, in, in teacher school that I didn't get. Um, and now one of the things that came up for me this week when I was thinking about these topics for me personally is what if I mess this up? Like, what, how do I, especially as um, a, a person who passes white and nobody would know my ethnic background other than white, when I step into a classroom and I'm male, there are certain assumptions that I make of me, that my students make of me, that my you know, colleagues make of me. And sometimes I think because I'm not... Um, as I as I increase my cultural competence to use the the vocabulary we set out at the beginning of the conversation, sometimes it's it's new. It's like learning a new language, and the mm -hmm. vocabulary and the competence is growing, um, and my sensitivity, my awareness grows. But sometimes it's it's like I feel like a tottering child getting going. And right. what do teachers do if if they mess up or if they they realize like they learn something like, wow, I thought I was being sensitive, but I was actually really putting somebody on the spot or I was doing something. I was trying to show my empathy, but I actually maybe have embarrassed the child or, you know, right. what do teachers do in that? How can, how can they build their confidence and still move forward? So I want to throw that back at you and say, have you ever made a mistake in the classroom? 
<laughs> yes, hundreds, hundreds, thousands. Right. And probably. when you make a mistake, what do you do? Wow. Yeah. You you regroup. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, if you're coming from a place of respect for the child, mm -hmm. and you make a mistake, and we all do, apologize. Right. Give a non-centered apology. Right. So Don't stop. Demand. Pause there. Can yeah. you give an example? Like, say I right. had I had made some mistake, and you can make, or some that you may have seen people typically make. How how would one? How would I? Can you role play that with me a little bit? So I've said to you, Yo, Mr. Rice, you did this, 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 and this, and this to me. Right? It really pissed me off, man. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you say. I'm really sorry I made that mistake. That was insensitive of me. I will learn to do better. Mm -hmm. Short, simple, to the point. What most people do is they go on and on. I didn't mean to, mm. or you misunderstood me. Okay. None of that. Just, I'm sorry. I will do better. Okay. And whatever they give you after that, take it. Mm -hmm. If you value the relationship, if you respect that child, you'll take it. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then go and do it. Got it. So it's really the apology and I'll do better or I'll learn better. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. improve as opposed to, yeah, because, I mean, all of us, I think we're trained when we say, to, as kids, say you're sorry it's, I'm sorry, but here's all the reasons why. Here's my thinking. Here's my motivation. Right. This is why right. I'm not wrong. And we don't say those words as adults. We get better at that. But even when you said that, it, <laughs> like you were so succinct. I was, I was like actually waiting for more. I was like, and you're like, no, keep it simple. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to be those exact words. But yeah. if you're sincere, the other person will know. Yeah. And not only that, they might not forgive you. Yeah. And you have to be okay with that. Yeah. That's the right to forgive is on them. Right. You don't own the right to be forgiven. Yeah. That's putting more oppression on them. Yeah. It's the expectation of forgiveness to, that right. is a, right. is the becomes the burden. Um Right. And then you just have to work to gain respect. Yeah. From that child or from that person. Yeah. Again, and if you're sincere, because you don't know at that moment all the hassle that child might have had to get through. To yeah, get to school. absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that last you might have said any other day, that kid might have been like, whatever, man. But yeah. Today, that was it. Yeah. And we've all been there. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when, you know, everything's <laughs> today, we, we got on, tested the audio video and we, you know, we started mm -hmm. the live stream and, and, uh, and, it didn't work. And, and yeah, right. we all experience those things that that's another thing that I have found that I think is so valuable, specifically in an education environment is not as, as the teacher, not only, you know, when something needs to be apologized for doing that and, and stepping up and saying, you know what, I could have done this better. And honestly, my students always know, like they can, they can tell me, uh, and often yeah. I ask them, you know, at the end of the year to, to, and they give really great feedback on how, from the, from a pedagogical standpoint, like what, what lessons could be better, what those kinds of things. But one thing that I found that is really valuable with my students is when I engage them, to your point, treat them with respect and build that trust over time, there's a, there's, a time when all their all their things are hitting once, all the tests are happening, or all they're mm -hmm. stressed out, and they bring all that in. And it, I imagine if somebody has been burdened their whole life with people who act like me, or think like me, or or present like me, mm -hmm. they're also bringing their own assumptions into that, and so part of that forgiveness is earning again rebuilding that trust because if right. the trust was very primitive or we were early on that stage they mm -hmm. haven't had a relationship with me more than maybe that quarter or that semester right. and one thing that 
white people do is, I didn't mean this and Mm. you misunderstood me. Your intent is of no importance. What matters is the damage that you did. Okay. Right? So, okay, maybe you're a nice person. Yeah. You just said something really crappy. Yeah. Right? And it hurt me. So the apology is for the giver. Mm. Right? For you to go, whoa, I messed up. Yeah. I need to do better. Yeah. Right? So and white people, they tend to get all caught up in that. And this is why you need to forgive me. And I'm a really nice person. And I have a black friend. And I yeah. do all when... And then, then they start with the white tears, and then we're the bad guys. Okay. All over again. I had a situation like that happen to me this past summer. So yeah, there's a lot to being culturally competent. It's not just handing a book. It's really thinking about your space as a white yeah. person and how yeah. you move through and the world. I'm I'm becoming aware of. Um, that I, I see that played out, and I think it's the natural human tendency is to, for all of us, again, as children, we're taught to apologize, and we, we justify because our intent is not, most of us don't intend to hurt other right. people, you know, right. and it, just in this moment, I'm really, I'm kind of pausing and taking, I, I knew with this topic, it's a uh, um, an important topic, but I, I want to, I'm kind of giving myself some space because I'm realizing that all of the, uh, the intent and no matter what that intent or, or my need to have that understood is actually an insecurity in my own, in my own self of, I need this person to understand quote, where I'm coming from and understand that I'm not that way. Um, and I think that's exacerbated because the, the power structures of our society for 300 years have divided us into us and them. And, um, you know, and in the context of, of um, culture and race, it's racist, non-racist, or, or you know, we've created this culture of racist and I'm not a racist. And mm-hmm. as soon as you say I'm not um, about anything, it becomes a, a need to justify that that right. is true as opposed to saying, and now I have the, the language to be able to say, I, I want to behave as an anti-racist. I want to be actively right. anti-racist. Um, and, right. and a lot of us don't have that vocabulary and, and probably some may not even know what that means, but right. we can still behave in anti-racist ways by recognizing simple things at first and recognizing that my need to be understood is my own need and I have to fill that up for myself. It's not about something that someone else, that anybody should be pressured to give me, whether it's a student someone I'm in a relationship with, a partner, a right. friend, a spouse. Mm-hmm. That's really deep And if for you're me. centering the child yeah. in the classroom, you're, that child needs for you to apologize mm-hmm. because that child needs to feel dignity mm-hmm. and respect. Those things that, right. that were taken from them inadvertently mm-hmm. or not. Right. And those things that you as the teacher... You who are the one who holds the power right, over that right. student, hold and wield all day, every day. Right. But if they can see that you are willing to learn from them, mm-hmm. they might feel taller, right. more empowered, respected. And yeah. we know kids get into fight all the time because mm-hmm. what? He disrespected Respect. me. Yeah, yeah. And that, as, as an educator, as you were saying that, w- the, the thing I would want for every student to walk out of my classroom with would be a sense of their own dignity in the world and their own power in the world and their own capacity to live and pursue their dreams and, their, and express their creativity. 
Um, so that's really helpful, and I appreciate that perspective so much. Um, I know it's probably helpful to everybody watching. If if you're joining, we're we're deep in the weeds just because I am. Um, this is really a master's class for me, and I'm kind of bringing you all along for this journey. But uh, we're talking about um, equity and and representation and the importance of student centered classrooms and really. Um, focusing on student-centered classrooms from the standpoint of equity and representation, what that means, how to actually build as a muscle, build that strength as a, as a teacher in order to build relationships with our students that will help them um, to and foster learning, trust, all the things we want in our classroom. Um, that was a, a kind of a long segment. Uh, those of you just joining, feel free to drop questions in the comments. Uh, other observations, please uh, join the conversation. I had asked, what do I do when I mess up? And that's, that's so helpful. Um, kind of piggybacking on that, and we've dived into it a little bit. What, is, uh, what are some ways that I can be, as, as a mature adult, I, in the dynamic of the classroom, I have the power. I have the, um, you know, the the authority in in that power dynamic of the student and and the teacher. Um, how do I, as I begin to be be more conscious, more culturally competent, and and aware, and more, um, and and build greater trust with my students? How do I process and even outside of the classroom, how do I work through the decentering of my own power and my own authority and my own influence, my own um, everything that comes with how I move in the world without question and without barrier and generally without barrier and without any sort of significant oppression? Um, how do we as teachers in a in a way that then makes us more um, effective as human beings, but also as teachers, um, because in my mind I'm thinking, okay, as things are happening in the class, it's not my students' responsibility to fix me or to teach me or to train me or to. That's an additional, especially from the position as somebody in authority. How do I, for lack of a better uh, expression, um, deal with the decentering of of my own whiteness and and in that space? Or, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I I tell this to the people that I see in my local political scene. It's really simple, but it's going to be really hard for you. Go to a neighborhood that you wouldn't normally go to. So I tell people, you want um, to encourage African-American voters, go to where the African-Americans live. Go to a neighborhood that is so foreign to you that you are the other. Mm. When you look around and you don't see anybody else that looks like you, that'll decenter you really quickly because sure. then you'll get it. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. Wait, I'm... they don't have the food I like here. They're not playing the music. Nobody looks like me. But he's wearing the same kind of clothes. No one speaks like me. <laughs> no one's making eye contact. Or they're making too much eye contact. Yeah. Right? That's what it's like for your students in class. Wow. And then after you've done that, start reading books mm -hmm. by people of other cultures okay you don't you don't need to pull out big biographies read the ya and the middle grade books that are out they're very good and they will give you insight into what that other world is yeah and then maybe in the off chance you have a kid who needs a book and you go oh you know, i read this book what do you think about this they're not going to expect you to have know anything about it yeah so they're gonna look, look at you sideways and go you know mr rice <laughs> you're into this and you're like yeah that was a good book i enjoyed it and i learned a lot that's 
I love that. It's so simple, but uh, I had an experience like that several years ago. Um, I, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas, as I may have told you, and and we have a lot of history here, obviously. Um, and and I remember spe a specific event. I was at a at a at a community event, and I went to. Um, it happened to be during Black History Month, and I went to our local Black History Museum. Um, for a networking event, and I walked in, and I was one of I think three white people in the in the space, and it wasn't extremely uncomfortable, but it was it immediate to when you said you'll immediately be decentered. It like I was I, now I have some reference for that because I remember thinking, oh, okay, I get it. Like mm -hmm. it's like and and being also mindful that everyone who doesn't look like me ex that's their experience every day and to your point mm -hmm. every time you walk into my classroom <clears throat> you're the one or one of two or one of three and how that can impact a a person's ability to learn even without them even realizing it becoming it because it's maybe become normalized for them in the sense that they grew up that way and and they're going uphill already just to just to get an education, just to survive in my classroom, just to, um, and it's going to take, I imagine, so much more energy and so much more, um, you know, effort to, to survive in the space energetically right. and to be successful in the space. And so I think it's, it's interesting because I, I'm seeing in my own thinking, kind of even in this hour, kind of this circle that's coming of recognizing that br being able to remove obstacles for my students through empathy, through building trust, through centering them in the classroom helps them to be able maybe just even if it's just in my space to be able to breathe a little easier to be able exactly. to experience a little more um success a little more academic success safety. yeah yeah that's so true that's even so for true. 50 minutes yeah that child feels a safe like space i'm safe here yeah and the rest of their whole day they might not be safe yeah and, and, and if you think about the, the amount of microaggressions and macroaggressions that kids have to deal with all day long, 50 minutes of safety is nothing. Yeah. And if you can provide that to them, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Who cares if you don't get to learn how to put the ing on a verb? Yeah. Who cares if you don't get to do the Pythagorean theorem? theorem if you can let that child feel like a human being who's safe they're going to remember you until and they they're probably going to have a better chance of remembering anything i teach as a as a maybe as a yeah maybe but is that always the end goal no we get i think in education it's easy to be, forget that because we have standards and we have testing and you know from a teacher's standpoint and I saw this with the COVID uh, crisis when uh, classrooms were shut down a lot of us had a lot of important conversations but a lot of the conversations are how am I going to get through my syllabus how am I going to make videos right. of my lecture and and we're trying to figure out at the same time have conversations of are Zoom calls even the best way to deliver content? Is a video of me lecturing to a camera an effective way? But a lot of the early conversations were just like, how are we going to make sure we can get these kids through so they can graduate? Or how can we, you know, check off the boxes that are on my list? But let's, let's take it down to an even more cellular level. Okay. Does this classroom, do they have access to computers at home. Mm, yeah. Do they have lunch at home? Yeah. Do they have access to clean clothes mm -hmm. at home? 
if you're sitting in clothes from two weeks and you haven't eaten since dinner because you normally get breakfast and lunch mm. at school, who cares how many Zoom meetings you have? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And when you really break it down to that level, everything is irrelevant other than getting them what they need as human beings. Yeah. And when they know that you went that extra, hey, you know, hey, I hear that so-and-so has this lunch program. Maybe you could go over there. They're going to look at you differently and go, Mr. Rice cares. Yeah, yeah. That's, Instead of being that's the, so important. the white savior, mm. right? Be in it with them. Hey, yeah. can I come to, you know, can I come to your neighborhood and help with the, you know, whatever drive? Or yeah. You see? Yeah. Be yeah. with them. Yeah, that's a, I remember um, when we were all first, my, my school is a residential school. And so we closed our campus and the kids had to go all back across the state, wherever they were living. And I remember those early couple of weeks right after campus closed, literally my class, um, when we, when we all got together on zoom, I told them my agenda is, are you okay? Like that's the lesson plan today is what's going on. Are you okay? And, and various variations of that, you know, like, because yeah, when, when you're, it's easier, I think, to see that in a global crisis when my life is turned upside down. Of course, all of a sudden that's top of mind, but I think your, your kind of admonition and recommendation is so important for us as teachers to remember, even beyond this immediate crisis in 12, 18, 24 months when we safely return to normal class to remember some of those experiences we had and the concern we had for student well-being, um, all of those things, you know, for us it was figuring out because everybody's going around the state, who has access to high-speed internet? Can we get enough, you know, hot spots for people? Who's going home, you know, to a place of food insecurity? And how can we mitigate that and all of those things? Um, as we kind of wrap this conversation and, and kind of tie it with a bow, because I could ask questions all night. I really am, um, I want to touch really briefly. There's, we could do a whole separate live stream, I think, on this. But um, when we start to challenge power structures and centuries old, millennia old beliefs and behaviors and how it's always been, obviously those there's resistance. There's sometimes very aggressive, violent resistance, but sometimes even to your point of microaggressions, there's these these small things. Um, what advice do you have as as instructors as we begin to become better advocates um, through centering our students? As we become better, uh, hopefully better um, advocates for our students and creating safe spaces. How do you recommend that we handle? And, and think about the resistance that is, is sure to come up and, and is sure to come, and sometimes not even from uh, an aggressive or, or, or uh, overly ho overtly hostile place, but when you challenge power stru structures, um, you bring uncertainty and, and people become fearful because of that and, and respond, you know, maybe from their lizard brain. Um, what right. advice would you have as as we begin to do this work and to strengthen our own um, our own ability to to be to be better? Right. So change is hard. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's necessary. And mm -hmm. through the years, things have not improved if were it not for disruptors. Mm -hmm. Right. There are always going to be people who resist. So you have to remember that these kids are going to have kids who are going to have kids who are going to need to be centered in the classroom. So it's up to you to make that situation, the classroom, the resources, the administration 
center all of the children. So it's going to be painful. Mm -hmm. You should expect that. Like I did get challenged. Oh, it's going to be hard. Oh, okay. Right. Let me let me tell you why this is what you need to do because it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. right? Because if things didn't change, we'd still be reading, I don't know, some text from 1920. Yeah. That suited the text at the time, but times are different. We have something called technology now, mm -hmm. right? So you have to change with the times. When I was growing up, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I learned a whole lot of words to describe people of different cultures that I knew was wrong, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when I tell my kids now the words that I grew up hearing every day, they're like, why would you say that? But I never said it, but that's, yeah, that's yeah. what it was at the time. Yeah. Things have to change. You have to change. The school system has to change to keep up with technology, the times, and the kids. Mm. Kids demand to be heard. They need to study. This goes back to To Kill a Mockingbird again. Mm -hmm. If you need to study social justice, don't pick To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. Pick something else. If you pick a book and you get pushback, pick a different book from the same topic. Mm -hmm. You just got to keep pushing if you respect your children, right? You're doing it for them. Yeah. It all comes back to how we started this conversation with how can we center the classroom for the students, all the students, and and why that is so important. And this has been, as I knew it would be, a, a really important conversation, a dynamic conversation. It's one that I'm going to carry in my mind and heart for uh, hopefully the rest of my life, but especially in these next uh, few days and, and weeks as as I go back and, and watch this uh, recording, I want to thank you for your time, your generosity of spirit and, and heart to share your perspective on this um, and, and your experience. And I don't take that lightly. I really personally appreciate it and I appreciate it for my viewers. I'm grateful to all of you that have joined us tonight on the live stream that have stuck around for this really important uh, topic and, and conversation. And I, I think it really is one of the most important conversations that matter that we've had in the series. So I thank you all for joining us this evening. Next week, we'll be back at 7 p.m. Central Time, uh, Thursday evening, Central Time. You can uh, find me on YouTube. Uh, it's also broadcast on Twitter and Twitch as well as Periscope. Um, so you can connect anywhere, but uh, the easiest place is, is YouTube. You can uh, subscribe to my channel there and you'll get uh, notifications. You can set reminders for the live stream every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, Pam, thanks so much again for your time and joining us this evening. It was a pleasure. Thank you.